Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Email podcast at providence.edu with questions or comments. Go Friars! Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Chittam. I'm joined, as always, by our producer and PC videographer, Chris Judge, class of 05. Here at the Providence College Podcast, we're excited to bring you stories from people within the FRA community. And today, we are joined by head women's basketball coach, Jim Crowley. Coach Crowley, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's quite an honor. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to have you. And, um, you know, the other day, it was obviously exciting for you to hit the 300 win mark for your career. With that said, just the other night, in the same week, Coach Cooley gets his 200th win. So do you kind of give him like a joke gift at all, saying like, hey, you know, 100 (laughs) wins away from me, coach. You're almost there. Hey, I'm older than you. So, (laughs) Uh, No, you know, as coaches, you don't even know. I'm sure I didn't really pay attention to it. Afterwards, someone said to my wife, like, hey, that's 300. And they did an amazing job here of of honoring that. Certainly they didn't need to do that or or anything, but it was really appreciated. Um, But my wife's like, I didn't why didn't you tell me it was 300 because it wasn't to me it's not 300 it was Binghamton you know and I'm sure Mm -hmm. for coach Cooley it was the same thing it wasn't 200 it was New Hampshire you know and then it's you know for him on to Rhode Island for us it was on to Hartford so right yeah because it at some point it has obviously kind of takes a back seat to the the kind of the end season kind of in season goals and milestones and things like that yeah it's Um, not even a back seat it's (laughs) it's in the back of the trailer you're you're just kind of focused on the next game and what you're doing with your current team right and we we, as we get into it we can talk about some of your past and obviously your first year head coach at Providence College Uh, you spent a long time at St. Bonaventure you had a lot of success there Um, I guess first things first you know you spent 20 seasons at St. Bonaventure which for I guess for for this profession, you know, college sports in general, uh, there's a lot of turnover from year to year. There's a lot of pressure to either, you know, win and move on or just a lot of pressure to win and stay. So what prompted you to stay so long at St. Bonaventure? Well, the the first part of it was, um, thankfully, they were very patient with me. Um, I wasn't very good when I started. <laughs> um, I, was, I was pretty bad, actually. Um, and they were very patient with me. And, and you know, so you appreciate that. And then then once we were able to get things going better, um, you know, there were some opportunities that, that were interesting, but things were just good there. You know, we had worked really hard to establish a culture. They treated me really well. It's a great place. Um, kind of off topic, but a unique story. The, the new president just named at St. Bonaventure. His two sons go to Providence. Oh, um, so, you know, the, the Catholics are all connected, I guess. Um, but, you know, they're, they're just really, really good people. It's a good life there. Um you know, so it just and and as you know, life just kind of goes by too. You you all of a sudden look and you're like, wait, I've been here how long? And you don't even really think about that. You just in in every profession, certainly in coaching, you just want to be uh, solid the year you have. So um, it just kind of got there, and I was fortunate they wanted to keep me, and and it was a good place, and and so it, things were were going well. So it didn't really seem like there was a reason to to change that. So ultimately, you know, a change does happen. And the opening comes up here at Providence College, and, and things progress within the interview process. If you could just take us kind of a peek inside the interview process within college athletics, how does that how does that work, and how does that work for you in terms of the process where you kind of are stuck in between two worlds, right? You're in a situation where, like, hey, this job might be a great fit for me. I should take a look at that. However, at the same time, you're you're coaching your team, or if you're if it's the off season, your off season workouts. You're still recruiting. You're still planning as if you're going to be there. So how do you kind of go through that process? Where you have these two options that are kind of diametrically opposed to one another? Yeah, it, it's a unique thing, and and you're right. You have this, you know, kind of list or or mindset of things that would be interesting to you, and 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 things that you opportunities you would look at. And sometimes you know you look at those and they're not what you think they would be. Or you look at those and you just realize it's not the right fit or it's not better than what you have, um, you know, and, and very rarely is, is financially part of that. You know, it's, it's, it's will I be able to be comfortable? Will I be able to, you know, run things the way I want to run them? You know, can I work with the people that are there? Those kind of things that, that really become important. Most important, is it a good place to go for my family? Um, so so you, you kind of weigh that. But the whole time you know that 
it doesn't matter if you go for this job, you've got to still be good at your current job. So um, you're mapping out all that stuff and, and you're, you know, coming to grips with that. And um, the the timing of this one and, and Providence was always a place that really interest me. I mean, from the time, even before I got out of high school, it was a, it was a school that was a really interesting place because, you know, growing on, up in upstate New York at the time, Syracuse, not far from Syracuse, they were in the Big East. And so you're watching Big East games all the time. And, um, you know, I've always kind of liked the underdog story. And Providence was always a small school and going against these big schools, but always they had great basketball and great history. Um, so it was always a place that, that was an interest to me. So when it, when it kind of came open suddenly, um, you know, there was people – I knew who knew the place well. And, and so I communicated with them and learned more about it. And at the time I was actually going on vacation for a little bit. Um, and, and vacation is always obviously time for your family and to relax. But for me, it's also a time to organize where I want to go the next year, uh, with the team. Um, you know, whether you're driving or flying, it's a lot of time that you get to think. So I was doing that. And while you're right, while you're doing that, you're also thinking about, the opportunity that, that you could be looking at and, and preparing for that um, and and trying to make sure that, you know, and at the time it was even a recruiting weekend. So, you know, I'm, I'm recruiting and I'm recruiting for the players at St. Bonaventure and being ready for that. But in the back of your mind, you're also, you know, prepping and, and just in case something comes. And at that point, nothing had, but you just, you know, I, I, you want to be prepared, um, you know, so you never really, until the day comes that you accept the other job, you, you, you at least for me, I never even thought, of things not didn't stop thinking about Bonaventure you know mm-hmm. I was always still preparing for what we were going to do there being in contact with my staff about what our plans were what we we're going to do with our workouts what we we're going to do moving forward in the summer and those kind of things so um it, it's it, it seems like a really crazy thing outside of it and yeah, I even thought it'd be crazier before I went through it it, it just kind of happens and and you're you you think oh I won't be ready for it but you you're just kind of ready for it and it happens and then you know kind of the next day boom you're Providence coach and you know you're all about Providence yeah I can imagine and when we had Bob Driscoll on the podcast he gave a quick anecdote about I think the interviews were up in Boston mm-hmm. right they kind of have a couple of candidates come in at once to try to make the the process a little bit more efficient uh, or as efficient as it can be and he mentioned how I think he was having lunch. And then you came over, introduced yourself, and said, "Hey, can I sit down and talk with you?" And this was kind of separate from the from the interview process, and how that that struck him as, "Wow, this is someone who I can really get to know." It really for him, it gave him, you know, a lot of I guess gut feeling positive attributes towards you and your potential as as a coach. With that said, kind of from the other side, when you were sitting there and you see this opportunity, what was going through your mind to do that? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it's interesting. I've heard him say that, and and my staff will tell you, and and so will my wife. Well, I was sitting there, and and we were up in Boston. I had gotten there early, um, so I'm like, well, I'm in Boston. I'm gonna go get some clam chowder and and uh, have some lunch. And I I look over, and I had never met uh, Bob before, but obviously, you do your research. You know, you know your your potential boss could look like. So I see him come and sit down. So I right away call my wife. I'm like, Bob Driscoll's sitting over there. What should I do? And she's like, idiot, go say hello. You know, like, <laughs> and again, uh, I'm fortunate to have a great wife. And uh, so I just go over and, and, you know, I'm Jim Crowley. And, uh, you know, I know we're going to be meeting later. I just wanted to say hello and thank you for the opportunity. And he's like, oh, sit down, sit down, sit down. And, and we had a great conversation. And when I came back, I, I told my wife and I told my staff, I said, if, if, if anything's going to happen, if I have a chance, it's because of that hour. It, 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 I, I felt the same thing. I was like, this is a guy, because uh, I've had great ADs at St. Bonaventure. And to me, that's just as important as anything else is, is can I work with the, the person who's in charge of me? And can I work with the person who's in charge of the department and what's their vision and all those great things? And, um, and, and I felt the same thing. And I was like, if I have a chance, it's because of that conversation we had and that connection we made. So it was really unique to hear him say the same thing right and then obviously it went well and you get named to the coach then you have to go through the summer period which has to be a turbulent time because not only do you have to ingratiate yourself with the pc community your players you're moving as well but then you also have a situation where you're recruiting for the next year i would assume changes at least a little bit in terms of the prospects that you're potentially looking at so i guess first of all how does your recruiting change 
from when you're at St. Bonaventure to you take the job at PC. How much does your list turn over, and how much do you have to look at new players? It, it turned over quite a bit. Um, you know, Bonaventure was a unique place to recruit to because of its location and, and some of the uh, uh, believed weather uh, restrictions. Um, but uh, when we got up here, it, it opened up a whole new world to us, and, and just specifically the New England world. You know, we weren't able to get a lot of kids – from this area and certainly from prep schools in New England down to um, Bonaventure just because it seemed like there was a lot of schools in between that we couldn't get them past. Um, so to get involved in, and, and there's great basketball with the prep schools and the, the public schools and in, in, in New England. So to, to try and catch up there and, and to get in, involved with that um, was something that we, we had to work on very quickly. Um, you know, as far as what we were looking for, that didn't change. You know, we we have our, our things that are really important to us. And, um, you know, certainly we have some great things to sell here. Unbelievable facilities, great location, the, the amount of building that is going on on campus. And that gives us uh, even more of a list to, to open up ourselves to. Um, but um, it was a, it was a major turnover. And, and because of that, we were behind. So we had to hustle with that. But with that, we also wanted to make sure you know, we we were focusing on, to me, the most important part, our, our current team. Um, you know, and everybody has their own way of doing thing and, and things, and recruiting is really, really important. Uh, but to me, the most important thing are the kids you have on your team. And, you know, a lot of people work really hard to have these great relationships with recruits, but then they don't have very good relationships with their own players. Um, I'd much rather have a really good relationship with my current players and and build relationships with the recruits so everybody has their own way that's kind of the way we do it and and you know hopefully it'll work out well here as it did at our previous stop so how do you start that process so when you you get hired from a reaching out to your current player standpoint i guess how do you logistically how do you start making that happen how do you start forming that relationship where you know obviously you have to build trust over time but ideally, you want to you know, speed up that time. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it, the first thing you do is you call them. You know, you, you call them and you, you have some conversations and you, you stay in touch with them that way. And, um, you know, three uh, three and, and, and three were here for the first session of summer school and then a fourth w- locally and came around and, and a couple other of the younger ones came around a little bit here and there. But then for second session of summer school, the whole team was here except for um, Yo-Yo, who's playing with her national team. So that really helped a lot, and and there was very much a feeling out period, um, you know, on uh, from both sides. Um, and to keep Yo-Yo involved, we we skyped, we consistently emailed, and and just kind of kept her up to date with the things going on. But as I said to my staff, we won't really get to know each other, and, and I mean the team and and me and and our coaches until we, we're with them every day and we see them every day. And you know that started around October first when we started practice and. And since then, it's really accelerated, and um, you know, I, I give the the kids a ton of credit. I, you know, they 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 have had to make a decision to accept us and what we we do, and they made it very quickly, and and have worked really hard at it. And obviously, that relationship isn't just about the players in you; it's about the players in your staff as well. And because your staff is basically your St. Bonaventure staff, you know, repeated here at PC, I guess what was for you the decision process of building your staff in terms of you know whether to bring in someone new and or keep the staff that you currently have and have had success with what was your kind of your thought process behind that and how does that affect the early part of your first year uh, in terms of you know forming those relationships with the team yeah it, it's unique everybody again has their own thoughts and and you know people always say recruiting 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 for me staff and schedule are are vital um to make the recruiting even be realistic. Um, there was never a thought in my mind of bringing someone new in. It was always going to be people who who I knew, who knew each other, and who knew the way we wanted to to operate. Um, and I was very upfront with my staff um, when this was happening, and that this was a realistic thing. And w- would you want to come? And thankfully, um, they all still want to stick around me. Um, and and so for me, it was easy because I know them. They know what we do. I trust them. They're exceptionally good at what they do. And I didn't have to worry about that part of it. There was enough other parts to worry about. Right. So I didn't have to worry about hiring someone. I didn't have to worry about going through resumes. I didn't have to worry about interviews. 
um, and I didn't want to. And and so I was able to to just put them in place, and we hit the ground running. They knew, you know, how we play our offense. They knew how we play our defense, and they knew how to teach that, and they know how to relate to kids. And um, they're they're really really good. Um, they're great representatives of of our program. They're great representatives of PC, and and I'm really proud that they're part of our staff. And 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 I think our kids truly appreciate um, how good they are and the time they're willing to give. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. And I can see that just taking, if for no other reason, taking just another, another, you know, couple things off your potential to-do list right. would make all the difference in the world. And then it helps, you know, kind of moving as a unit can, can certainly ease the process from a teaching standpoint where you don't have to teach another coach how to coach your system, uh, which brings up, you know, your system in general. You know, when you have a team that you're, you're bringing along, you can at what point do you decide, all right, we're going to put in the full system versus weighing, putting the system in incrementally and try to look for more short-term success as opposed to, all right, this is the system we want. If it hampers us for a semester, it hampers us, but maybe we'll be better later on. For you, is that is that something you have to weigh or is it just, or is it easy? No, we go full bore. This is the system that we want and you know that we'll, we'll just see what happens. Yeah, it's that's always been kind of a, question that people have even asked me uh, at Bonaventure, you know, we're fortunate to have some success and, and people kind of label us um, some ways. I don't think they're always fair labels with how we play. Um, And they would always be like, well, you know, if you go to a different school, would you play the same way? And my answer has always been the same. Why would I do something different that works? Um, And and how would you describe that that style of play? I I think it's pretty simple. I, I think we, we take care of the ball. We take good shots and we play defense. Like, you know, a lot of people like to say, uh, you know, they, they're, you know, they play slow, you know, obviously your opponents like to, to find different things. Um, but at the heart, that's what we do. You know, we, we try to, um, you know, take care of the ball. We try to take good shots and we, we try to play good defense, obviously with, with playing really hard. So, um, we're not, I'm a big believer in the discipline of simplicity. Um, we're not going to. You know, we're not going to have more plays than than we can name. We're not going to have eight different defenses. Um, we're going to do what we do, and we're going to do it at a at a level as high as we can, and we're going to keep practicing it. And you know, I, I've I've I literally told the team yesterday, you know, drills we're doing today, you'll be doing three years from now. Um, you know, so we can get really really good at it. Um, and that's you know, you talk about kind of the short term to the long term. Um, because it's kind of you know it's emotional offense so you play off each other so your hope is that as they continue to to know themselves and know each other that keeps getting better and better um you know the defense you just hope through repetition it gets better and better um but yeah we put it in right away um you know offense was the focus uh with all the individual stuff and all the preseason stuff but once we got into season it, it was you know then the team defense and how we how we play it that way and um you know, we've been very fortunate. Our kids have, have really responded to it well. And, again, I, my staff is really, really good at teaching it. Well, that's an understatement because if you just look at the stats, it's, it really is something else. Your team's shooting 49% from the field, 42% from three, and you have an even assisted turnover ratio, 82-82, which is just amazing. You know, the, those, those, those are incredible stat lines. Um, obviously, you've, from a small sample size, you know, you've played six games. Obviously, you're 6-0. and oh, um, So it's not the length of a full season in terms of looking at those stats. And things can get more difficult in conference play, usually, especially the second time around, because people get to know you a little bit better. With that said, those stats are incredible. So do you have goals for those numbers, game to game, and for the season? You know, how, do you, how do you, I guess, let me put it this way. For setting goals for the team, how much is based game game by game on individual statistics and team statistics versus win totals and things like that? And how do you set goals for your team? I have two really simple goals, and I don't talk about them very often, but they're neither are numerical. Um, you know, at, at the end of the year, um, I hope that our kids still like each other and still like basketball. That's that's the only goals I go into a season every season with, because um, I figure if at the end of the year that's happened, we've probably had a decent year. Um, so those are really all the goals. And we, we don't, we don't say, Hey, this game, we've got to have a positive system or ratio this game. We've got to out rebound them. You know, we'll say things that, you know, based game by game, by like, it's really important. We win the free throw battle this game, or, you know, they go the boards hard. We gotta, we gotta limit their scoring off rebounds. 
Um, and then we'll talk after games of positive things. You know, we'll always bring up if we have an even or, or positive assist to turnover ratio. But as far as specific um, numbers, we don't talk about those a lot. Um, I used to, and, and then I realized it wasn't who I was. I'm an eye guy, and I'm a gut guy. So if I like what I see, then I, I feel like we're doing all right. And, and, and if I got a bad feeling in my gut, then I know we're not doing what we need to. So I really just try to trust my instincts on that. My staff does a really good job of, of observing things. I didn't even know we had one kid who was not, not shooting it very well. I didn't even know because I didn't feel like she was taking bad shots. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that, that those numbers were there. Um, so it, for me, and I think most coaches will tell you the, the big thing is, is trusting what works for you. You know, some people are very analytical. Some people are very number driven and can, can get great things off of that. Um, that's not in my wheelhouse. Um, I'm, I'm much more, um, you know, even, even winning or losing a lot of times I don't even really know the score till, till later because I just go with what is going in the flow of the game and, and what I'm seeing. Now, does that affect how you view tape later on? Like say after the game or, uh, if you're doing some self scouting, uh, how do you, juxtapose that kind of the gut feeling in the moment with what you might see on tape later on because obviously uh, i know for most coaches you obviously can see more in tape than you can when you're you know floor level the emotions are running high it's easier to focus on certain things or focus on what has just happened and maybe you're not seeing things as clearly clearly as you like so as you kind of review a game as you go all right so this is what happened this is how we can improve you do the self-scouting that you need to do before each game how does your in the moment analysis often relate to you know the, the next night yeah I, I really lean on my my staff and the conversations we have we have daily conversations getting ready for practice but a lot of those conversations then turn into talking about our team um whoever the way we do it is whoever whatever assistant has the scout um will then after the game uh, give me analysis of the game and go through that i i often don't rewatch a game till the end of the year i rewatch all of them a couple times and and do all of my observations and but after a game I'll take some moments throughout the night and and jot notes to myself of things that I'm replaying in my head and and then I put those with the the evaluation that the assistants given and then we'll have a conversation as a staff and all that stuff kind of goes into um the process of, of what we're seeing and, and and what we're analyzing. And the reason I think that that works okay for us is because we're not doing so many different things mm-hmm. because we have our one defense and our one offense. So it's consistent with the issues of improvement. You know, we, we can really fine tune those because we see it, you know, maybe someone had a bad game, but then if they've done it two games in a row, now we know we have this issue, whatever it may be. So it's not as much, Hey, our two, two, one press isn't looking good. We've got to work on that. Or, well, we're not going to use it for three games, so or our zone isn't as good. We, you know, we don't have those decisions to make. It, it's very uh, personnel-based. It's very individual-based. So because of that, we, we feel that, that we get a pretty good analysis of that through, you know, my staff, through our conversations, and through kind of my um, mental replay of it. Right. And as you progress through the preseason, or kind of the, the pre-conference schedule, I should say, what are some of the things that you feel like you're concentrating on or kind of your primary points of emphasis as you get ready for Big East play? Well, as you talked about, our numbers offensively are pretty good. Um, obviously, as you get into scouting and, and how well people can play above scout and, and, and adjustments there are something we, we want to keep preparing for and that we talk about. But but for for me, it, our issue is defensively and, and how good can we get defensively and how much can we focus on that and how important can that become to us can that become something we do or can that become something we we pride ourselves in um you know again we we have some people that can put in the basket more than i thought um so now how well can we we defend and how well can we can we win a game when we don't put it in the basket so far we've we've won games because we put in the basket pretty well that isn't always going to be the case so can we find a way to still win a game where we shoot 37 percent and and so for that's my number one concern but you could ask me that in september and i would have said that was my number one concern is is you know will we defend because i've always felt like that's something we we could count on and our programs have always done pretty well 
And then, obviously, you mentioned earlier there's so much construction going on on campus, and a lot of that impacts you, not only in terms of you know, you're recruiting someone for a specific major, you see the business school coming up, and that affects your recruitment, but more specifically with the basketball, men's basketball practice facility going up, the Ruane Fire Development Center, that gets a lot of publicity. What kind of gets lost in the shuffle is that how much that's going to change your program, you know, because you see parts of Alumni Hall are going to get completely renovated. It's going to completely open up what you guys have as a at your disposal from a not only from an office's standpoint, but you can have a lot more access to the gym here at Alumni Hall than you currently have. So, how will that impact your program moving forward? I, I think the biggest impact is is that it shows our our current players. It, it shows potential future players just how invested PC is in women's basketball. That, that that it matters that that not just they say hey this hey that no there's action there's there's things going on that are are viable concrete things that are are making our program better there's money being spent to make our program better and and to give us more opportunities and we already have a ton i mean what what they give us here we are so thankful for and and so uh and incredible already and they're doing more. Um, so for us, it's it's obviously it's finding recruits who appreciate that and who value that. And and for the kids in our program, it's making sure that we represent that well and that we we earn that. And and we we have to, the only way we can earn that is is by representing the school well with our work ethic and and with our commitment to to getting better. And you've seen the fall sports teams have just done unbelievably well. I mean, just across the board. Had, do you feel like that provides momentum within the athletic department at all for us, either for for the staff and or the players? Absolutely, I, I think it, it's so. You know, our our team when we were just down in Wilmington last weekend on um, Saturday night, they they watched the men's soccer game together, and you know they're they're chanting fry or fry or you know, and and even on the bus. Uh, you know, when we came back from the flight and we're pulling on to um, Huxley and, you know, they see the big board on JP Field, they're all excited. Yeah, they start charting Friars again. So, um, you know, to, to have that pride and to be fortunate enough to be part of it and then also, you know, to, to, to see teams reach that level and, and to be around student athletes who, who are pushing for that level – that's a that's that's and coaches who are gotten that level. That's a great inspiration for us as coaches. It's a great inspiration for our, our student athletes, and um, you know, it's just it's a it's a mindset and mentality that that Bob has built here. That's that I had no idea was here. You know, when I came on campus, uh, you know, Bob took me around on Mother's Day. I was I was not just blown away by the facilities, but just by the approach people have the 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 regular talk about competing for championships and and doing it the right way while still graduating all of our student athletes and then living that um it's it's a really special thing going on and um you know success breeds success as long as you stay focused on it and and they do here and and it's it's a lot of fun to to be part of different teams that are winning right because i think a lot of people and it's easy to understand they don't understand that they don't see that the student athletes you know they're friends with more than just the kids on their team right Right, so they're you know, the whether they're in class or they see them at Raymond Hall or they're eating at Alumni or you no know, in Slavin, and that they have these interactions with their peers or they're in the student athlete training center. Right, they're getting taped up before practice or getting ice after practice. That those interactions can breed the same sort of culture that can happen within a team. Absolutely, and 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 I think it's good. You're obviously you're happy for your your student colleague. You're you're happy for your coaching colleague. But you're also motivated by them. You want some of that, you know, or you should. And and we've talked about that with our team. And and it's certainly, it's it's attainable. You know, you see it and you're like, hey, this is attainable here. All right, what do we have to do to to get there? Certainly not easy. Certainly not just going to happen because we we you know put on a Providence jersey. So how can we earn it? What have they done to earn it? How can that you know affect us? How can that make us better? How can we learn from that? Um, you know, we've had those discussions, and, and it's been kind of neat to watch our kids, I think, see things in a little different way. You know, they, they were talking about the soccer team and the injuries they've had and still the success they're having and, and people elevating their play and, and coming together and all those things. When when our kids are having those all, those conversations on their own, not being led by us, that gets you excited as a coach because you're seeing them want to be part of it. You're seeing them take some ownership in it and believe that, that it can be possible um, for them as well. So obviously you expected great things when you came here. You wouldn't have come if you didn't. 
But with that said, what has either transpired or what have you seen at PC that you've enjoyed that you didn't necessarily expect before coming here? I feel like I should answer that quicker than I am. <laughs> um, and it's not because things haven't been really, really good. They, they have been. Um, I, I just, I, I'm just not someone who has a lot of expectations. You know, mm-hmm. I just kind of like to keep my head down and get my job done. Um, but I, I, I would say the thing that's been really, um, on, a, on a personal note, just has been really um, impressive and, and really helped me is just, the, the the fellow coaches and and their you know willingness to stop by their willingness to say hi shoot a text um their true caring for for not just how our team's doing but how i'm doing how my family's doing um the genuineness of that and and the genuineness of of the people uh, in in at the college but certainly the people i deal with more which are the people you know in, in athletics has really um I don't want to say it surprised me because you don't want to say people being genuine surprises you, but it's it's been really gratifying and, and really motivated me to, to help us, um, you know, try to be better. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, 6-0 and oh right now, big, big in-state tournament this weekend, kind of the Battle of Rhode Island, so to speak. Good luck the rest of the way, and uh, hope we can get you on later on in the year. Hopefully, we just don't want to. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for, for having me. As I said uh, before, you, you do an amazing job with this, you and Chris. And it's really, it, it's an impressive thing that you guys do. And it's, it's truly an honor to, that you would invite me and let me be part of it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Coach.